politician that's been putting herself uh, out in the open as well, um, and she's stayed so resilient over these past few years. So please welcome Dr. Trudy Deacon, PhD. <laughs> Thank you for your lovely introductions, Tam. I mean, how can I follow that? <laughs> Especially being a dietitian. <laughs> oh. I'm also a Yorkshire lass. So we don't get lost in translation. I thought I'd put a few terms up there to help you out through the next 40 minutes. <laughs> we eat all, we drink all, or we sup up, and we pay not. So, thanks very much for dinner last night, Sam. It was much appreciated. <laughs> so, we are a bit tight in Yorkshire. So, you'd expect me to have quite a long list of conflicts of interest? Mm? But, no. I'm employed by the charity Expert Health, and neither myself or the charity take any funds from the pharmaceutical industry or the food industry. So we just don't want the muck. <laughs> so nutritional research started with identifying individual nutrients for deficiencies, for conditions. So we think about scurvy. Vitamin C was identified as a deficiency that caused scurvy. Vitamin D caused rickets. Vitamin A, night blindness, and thiamine for beriberi. So you can understand how the thought of nutrition, a single nutrient causing a deficiency, a disease, actually emerged. But these diseases have been largely eradicated now, and it's been replaced with a long-term condition such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease and obesity. And people like to keep things simple, don't they? So A causes B. So you know where I'm going, don't you? So we now have people trying to say that sodium salt causes hypertension. Saturated fat causes heart disease. And protein causes kidney failure. But it's a little bit more complex than that, isn't it? And a lot of nutritional research is done from observational cohort studies. And we know that these can't prove causation. There's a lot of limitations. And ideally, the findings from a cohort study should be tested out with a good quality randomised control trial. And very t few times does this actually happen. And when it does happen, 80% of the conclusions from cohort studies are proved wrong. Now, the best, what we say is the best level of evidence is the systematic reviews and meta-analyses. But if these are done on poorly, poor quality cohort studies, then we can't say it's gold level evidence, best level evidence. So there's a huge amount of limitations. And this is the problem with correlation. <laughs> correlation can't prove it. So I really urge you not to eat any cheese today because tonight you might get strangled by your bed covers. Collecting dietary information from participants is also notoriously difficult. So often the free, uh, food frequency questionnaire is used and people are asked to rank what foods they've eaten over the previous year. There's also when people are asked to keep a food diary for three to seven days. And then there's a 24 hour dietary call but they've all got problems. And the other way of actually collecting dietary information is by providing people with the food and locking them up. But then that research is no longer realistic. So there's many problems. And one thing, one of the problems is that people can't even remember what they had for lunch on that same day. And one of the reasons for that is people often eat on their own and they often eat whilst they're working as well. <laughs> 
and portion sizes have increased. So when the analysers look at what people are being eating, then often they ignore the fact that portion sizes are a lot bigger now. And how many refills have people had of the sugar sweetened beverages and how many second helpings have they had? There's other influences too. Money. People are often uh, funded to do industry funded research and we know that they're more likely to be 30% 30, 30 more successful. You know, show more, 30% more, 30 more likely to show a positive outcome. But also people may get funding removed if they're not doing the research that the funders want them to do. We also have the 17 year lag time from research to practice and this con uh, causes controversy along the way because people can be at different levels of that understanding of the new research. <coughs> then there's vested interest and we say that it's very difficult for someone to understand something when their job relies on them not understanding it. Reputation. And credibility. So it's a lot easier, and I'm sure Tim Noakes will agree with this, it's a lot easier to toe the line than to do something different. So people often stick with the accepted just to maintain credibility. And then there's building up on old evidence. So a lot of the nutritional guidelines out there, rather than starting from scratch, they're just building on previous uh, guidance and that previous guidance the same areas are carried forward and then you may recognize this lady here there's the key influences and sometimes I feel a little bit like this because they're influencing the policy uh, they're the policy makers and um, and they influence the nutritional recommendations Another problem is that often the research is based off risk factors, even if those risk factors haven't been proven, such as heart disease and cholesterol. And it's about sometimes the risk factors don't identify the root cause of a problem. So another example of this is inflammation. We know that inflammation is a root cause of many, many long term conditions, but it's not actually assessed. Public health campaigns, so individuals who are health conscious, have over the years taken notice of campaigns such as this. And that makes those individuals fearful of eating certain things such as red meat. So the people who continue to eat red meat, unless they're low carb, high fat, <coughs> tend to also have unhealthier lifestyles. So they may smoke more, drink more, etc. Now, these cohort studies do try and control for these confounders, but it's impossible to control for everything. So today, I'm going to present to you a brief critique of the updated Diabetes UK recommendations that were, came out, were published in March. Now, the cover, and Ian alluded to this yesterday, the cover looks fantastic, real foods. But unfortunately, throughout the whole recommendations, there's not one recommendation that informs that we should be advising patients to cut the processed food and adopt a real food diet. So there's some really good stuff. And one of the good things is, is now it recognises that one size doesn't fit all and we need to, off we need to offer an individualised approach. So that's great. There's some not so good stuff as well. And one of them is that they've built on from the previous guidelines. And the last update from Diabetes UK was in 2011. Also, there's been no robust recruitment process of the dietitians involved in the working group, no vetting of the critical appraisal skills. So it's been more like who's already known to Diabetes UK that have been um, onto, um, cohort onto the, onto the panel. So how do I know that there was errors in the Diabetes UK guidelines published in 2011? Well, I was on the panel. <laughs> and uh, I did raise concerns uh, because there was no robust search strategy, no robust literature review. 
one dietitian did the searches and then assigned each member to a topic and my topic was on education models. I did write in an email to raise my concerns and I said that you know these, con these uh, guidance should be based on evidence and I was concerned that there wasn't a robust search strategy involved in that but my concerns got ignored. So after the first draft had been prepared, I wrote a 22 page critique of the draft and stated that, you know, in areas, just one reference had been picked to um, back that recommendation and that, you know, we shouldn't have evidence-based nutritional guidelines choosing just one reference without doing a full literature review. Again, I was ignored. So I'm really quite puzzled why I wasn't asked to be on the committee for, for, for this update. I, I really can't understand why I wasn't asked. Um, so one good thing about the review this time is that they did present a search strategy and they did search all the databases and it states that in the recommendations. I did contact um, Douglas24 from Diabetes UK, who was a co-chair of the working group, and said, please can you share with me your research questions and your search words, and he has done. And so this is great. I'm a little disappointed that they're still emphasising risk rather than events or mortality, and they're still considering cholesterol, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. They also, as well, uh, use grade to grade the quality of the research. So if they've graded something one, it's weak evidence. And if they've graded something four, it's classed as strong evidence. So I went back to Douglas and I said, is it possible to share with me how you added or deducted points? Because I'd really like to understand you know, how you have actually referenced or whether you've put a strong or a weak association to that reference. He came back and said, you probably won't be able to see that, but he came back and said, no, it wasn't possible to share with me their justification. So it does make me question if this was in a, done in a systematic way. So moving on to the recommendations, then I'm not going to touch on everything because I haven't got time, but I'm just going to touch on the points that are perhaps more controversial. And around uh, nutritional management and models of education, I think the recommendation that everyone should see a registered dietitian it shouldn't be graded at three because the references that they used are back in the 1990s. They were done in the US under the insurance, NHS, insurance health model and also in Australia. And also in the 1990s, I was working in the NHS in diabetes and we were advising patients to calculate the carbohydrate um, much more than we have done since. So the dietary guidelines have changed since then. So I don't think we can say that dietitians have got strong evidence that they are improving the care of people with diabetes. And so I have, some, I have some more recent evidence here. So delivering expert education over the last three years uh, entered onto the audit database is around 50,000 patients. And about two thirds of that education has been delivered by dietitians. And so I compared uh, dietitian delivery with non-dietitian delivery. And you can see here that completion, satisfaction, empowerment, very, very similar. Dietitians are uh, receiving, um, achieving a slightly better weight loss, um, but um, it's the same body mass index reduction. Same for waist circumference reduction, and the non-dietitians are getting slightly better reductions in HbA1c. But it's, it's similar, it's about the same. And I'm not against dietitians. Dietitians are fab, I am one. And we have such a, an opportunity to make a difference to people's health and well-being. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that there isn't enough dietitians and there isn't enough dietitians who are absolutely current to provide people with evidence-based care. And so I think it's down to the whole healthcare team that should be supplying the lifestyle education. And I think this proves that you know, the non-dietitians can provide it as well. So moving on now to the prevention of diabetes. One thing with the recommendations is that there's a lack of 
the cause of pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. So in those recommendations, there's not one recommendation to address the etiology, the cause. And what is the cause? And this is from Joseph Kraft's work, it's the hyperinsulinemia. So for decades before someone's diagnosed with diabetes, their insulin levels rise. And insulin levels rising then leads to insulin resistance. So what we need to address and what the recommendations should look at is how we drive down those insulin levels. We know that when um, a norm, lean, normal lean individual has got insulin levels, tends to be fasting insulin levels below 10. In impaired glucose tolerance, insulin levels rise hugely and even in advanced type 2 diabetes, insulin levels are higher than they are in normal lean individuals. So that was an omission that I think should have been included. What have they included? They've included some key lifestyle factors. And where these come from? They've come from the published diabetes prevention studies, mainly the Finnish one and the US one. And that's when people were recommended to reduce their energy intake, reduce saturated fat, reduce total fat, and increase fiber. Is that what happened? So this is from the Finnish study and what you can see here is less than 50% of people were able to adhere with a total fat reduction. Less than one in four people were able to adhere with the saturated fat goal or the fibre goal. So the only recommendation or the goal they were able to really strongly adhere to was the exercise goal. And then moving on to the diabetes prevention study that was done in the States, then the fat and calorie goals were only there to achieve weight loss. And this article here actually acknowledges that if people were achieving the weight loss, then the coaches didn't care what fat and calories they were having. So even if when they did the dietary assessments, they were having more calories or more fat in their diet, they weren't advised to reduce them. So I don't think that we can actually say that the success from the diabetes prevention studies were, were down to the dietary recommendations made in them. If we reduce calorie intake, and Zoe did an excellent presentation on this yesterday, then we have this metabolic adaptation. And what this means is that this is from The Biggest Loser. You might have heard it, the US um, TV series. And what The Biggest Loser showed is that when individuals lost weight, this line here is the reduction in the expected metabolic rate you, you expect from people losing that level of weight what they saw was 500 calories more. And that didn't even recover six years later. So when people damage the metabolism by reducing their calories and um, then put weight back on, the metabolic rate doesn't recover. So it becomes even harder for them to lose weight in the future. Going back to the insulin levels, if we don't educate people how to reduce their insulin levels, it's difficult for them to lose weight. Because the higher the insulin, then there's virtually no fat used for energy, no, virtually no fat breakdown. As the insulin levels come down, and so in type 1 diabetes, what do we find? Insulin levels are very, very low, and they lose weight dramatically before they're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So any way we can help individuals to reduce their insulin levels, their fat burning ability is going to increase. So this is one of the diagrams we're showing the patient material to help them understand it. That if you've got high insulin levels, then your body's going to be more likely to store fat for energy, from the energy rather than use it. And then the body can feel it's been starved of energy, so that leads to the individual feeling tired and lethargic. But it also stimulates the hunger hormones and makes people feel hungry. So we explain it's a bit like there's a padlock on one's internal fat stores. They can't access their own fat stores as an energy source. And we need to help these individuals to remove that padlock. Any healthy individual should have sufficient 
energy stored in their body and they shouldn't have to feel hungry or tired. So the lady at the top, she's 45 kilograms and her body fat is very low. She's an athlete. She's 10 or 12% body fat. How many thousand calories do you think she's got stored in her body? 44,000 calories of fat stored in her body. The middle lady there, she's kind of got a normal percentage of body fat for a woman. She weighs 70 kilos and she's got 157,000 of calories stored in her body. The lady at the bottom here, she's 95 kilos, 50% of her body is fat. She's got 427,000 calories of fat stored in her body. So why do people who are overweight often say, I feel tired, I feel hungry? It's likely because of the high insulin levels. So another thing that the prevention studies have shown is that triglycerides, fasting plasma glucose, um, uh, are more predictable of developing type 2 diabetes. So I wonder why these recommendations target weight loss. 5% weight loss rather than targeting the criteria for the metabolic syndrome. So that was the uh, prevention and the guidance from the Diabetes Prevention, but also Diabetes UK recommends certain diets as reducing the risk of diabetes. So if you look at these, I'm not going to go into detail of the Mediterranean because that's not controversial. Everyone accepts that it's a hard data, systematic reviews, meta-analysis showing that the Mediterranean diet is good for us. But what about the DASH diet? The DASH diet came in to reduce um, hypertension, so it's low sodium, it tends to be low fat, whole grains, lots of fruit and veg. Now this study that's supposed to provide evidence that it can reduce type 2 diabetes was done off one FFQ, one frequency food questionnaire. And it wasn't, no dietary advice was provided to the participants. It was a retrospective study where they just looked at what people were eating and then assigned a score based on how they thought they were adhering to a DASH type of diet. And, um, and so I would, you know, and it was also showed an effect in whites, but not in blacks or his, his, uh, Hispanics. So I would, they've assigned a grade two to that, and I would downgrade that to one, if at all. Then there's a the vegetarian diet. And again, it's just based off one food frequency questionnaire. And there was a lot of confounders there. And we said already, you can't control for everything. And it wasn't generalizable to the UK population because it was done on the Aventis population in the US. And uh, if anything at all, it might show that plant food is protective. But it doesn't show that eating animal food is a risk factor. And Diabetes UK also, these when I've got things at the top in bold, in inverted commas, they're also promoting plant food diets. But once again, it was based off the uh, cohort studies using fruit frequency questionnaires. And what it actually showed in individuals who increased their plant food but reduced their sugar and junk food uh, and who were more health conscious had a reduced risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So is that saying that plant food diets are more effective? No. The Nordic diet then, once again, many, many limitations. They only looked at six food types. Fish, cabbage, rye bread, oatmeal, apples, pears and root vegetables. How can you assign a risk of development diabetes with just considering six types of food? So they've said that a moderate restriction of carbohydrate may reduce risk of developing diabetes. But when I looked at the paper that they actually had referenced, they're comparing 210 grams of carbs a day with 115. Now, in my mind, 115 grams of carbs a day is a low-carb diet, not a moderate-carb diet. Am I correct in thinking that? Yeah. So, again, it's cohort study, so I think it should be a grade two evidence, 
But I think they need to change the terminology from moderate carbohydrate restriction to a low carb diet. Now, when they've looked at different studies and put them together to see which dietary approach is likely to be more effective, then they've referenced two reviews. The first review here also included studies that in addition to the popular diet recommended people to eat less and move more. So they weren't just testing the diet, they were testing other things on top. So it's very difficult to actually tease out what was being effective there. Then the Tobias review actually concluded <coughs> that evidence from RCTs does not support low-fat diets over and above other types of diets. So the low-carb diet was actually shown to be more effective. So it suggests to me that the recommendations and the terminology within the recommendations are slightly biased against the low-carbohydrate diet. One review that wasn't included in their recommendations was this one that was done in 2017 and it was before the cutoff date for their literature search. And what it shows quite clearly that in the short term and in the, sh in the longer term, the Atkins and the Paleo diet were more effective at achieving weight loss goals. But all that being said, the recommendations are great because it does say that we need to offer flexibility in dietary approaches. So that's great. So we now have got the recommendation to say we can be flexible with our patients. So moving on to weight management and remission. What is fantastic is now recognised that type 2 diabetes can go into remission. That's a, definitely a step in the right direction. But there's a lot of emphasis here on weight. Now we know that this first one here, 15 kilogram weight loss, came from the direct study with Professor Roy Taylor at Newcastle University and Professor Mike Lee at Glasgow. Uh, but it wasn't just about the 15 kilogram weight loss, it was about the loss of fat from the liver and the pancreas. So just focusing on weight, I think, is a limitation. And leading on to the fact that they recommend that a 5% weight loss actually will help to achieve metabolic factors such as HbA1c and cardiovascular disease risk. So again, it's focused on weight. So they've now reviewed different types of studies to actually achieve weight loss. And they've said that there's no difference between the different studies, that they can all show moderate weight loss. But when you actually look, they provided five references for this. And when you look at the five references, then the first reference here actually showed that low carb, low GI, Mediterranean high protein were all better than the low fat diet for reducing HbA1c and only the low carb and the Mediterranean diet were more effective at reducing weight. Reference two, then they concluded as the carb restriction was greater, then that had more impact on improving HbA1c. So you can see here that as the carb intake went down, there was a greater difference between the control arm and the intervention arm. Often the, um, it acknowledged that medication, because we see a reduction in medication when people go low carb, and this dilutes the effect of the reduction in HbA1c, and this often isn't recognised. And many of the studies only had like a 3% difference in the amount of carbohydrate consumed between the low carb arm and the, and the low fat arm. So I was whizzing through these ones now, there was many limitations, so you can understand why the panel arrived at the conclusion that there was no differences between the different diets. And, and so that's the problem with literature, you know, that we can see anecdotal, we see in our patients, in our clinics, but in these trials it's all about means and not everybody, some people enter into the trial and don't make the recommended changes. So improvements, I feel, should be to provide the education and support to help people adhere to the, diet, the carbohydrate restriction better. 
We need to perhaps only look at studies that achieve a less than 130 grams of carbs for low carb diets or less than 50 grams of carbs for very low carb diets because a lot of these studies compared less than 45% energy from carbohydrate with more than 45% energy from carbohydrate. So there's going to be a huge amount of overlap there. We need to get people to record what they're eating so we can do really good, robust analysis of the actual carbohydrate intake. And I think we need to measure visual fat uh, because that's what we want to see for diabetes remission. We want to see a reduction in the fat around the organs to reduce um, people developing type 2 diabetes and allowing people to go into remission. So we need to also do sensitivity analyses to see what's working in these trials and what level of restriction is best. And we may not find that because what I'm seeing is that what, what works for one person might not work for somebody else. So there is definitely individual variation. <laughs> okay, again there's a focus on weight loss here. So rather than where the weight is stored. And this study said, you know, the recommendation said a reduction in BMI improves HB1C. But the only independent um, uh, fat me measure was the uh, hepatic fat. So I don't think we should forget, you know, where the fat is stored. And this is brilliant. This is actually the best thing about the recommendations. So offer individualised education, uh, quantify carbohydrate intake, encourage low glycemic index and consider reducing the total amount of carbohydrates. We need to frame that, don't we? That is fantastic. But then they move on to talking about evidence is limited, there's contradictory results, there's lack of clarity, there's lack of long-term effects. So it's, I've, I've listed the limitations here and one of the limitations is that there's bigger dropouts in the clinical trials of people doing low carb, but when you actually see it, there's larger, drop, larger dropouts with the low fat. Um, and I've mentioned the other limitations already. But there's around 11 trials now. Now, some of these would be after the cutoff date that they actually searched. But just to give you an idea, there's around 11 trials. They're not all achieving the carbohydrate restriction. But do you see most of those outcomes for HB1C in the minus or the plus factor? Most of them are in the minus, yeah. Only five out of the 11 are actually statistically significant but you don't really see it the other way around. So we're getting emerging data that restricting carbohydrate improves HP1C. And of course, there's the many, many other benefits as well, which we haven't got time to go into. Now, you won't see this in detail, but I'm just doing some uh, education with patients at the moment. There's one gentleman that documented his intake at the start, and what he was having was 43% of, um, of energy from carbohydrates. One week later, he was having 10% of uh, his energy from carbohydrates. And he you know, felt he had had the education to do it confidently without any of the side effects. And he sent me a text and the text said he had to measure his waist circumference three times because it had gone down 10 centimetres in one week. So that's fantastic. But I also think we need to be mindful for individuals that it's not for them. So on the same day, I had a text from another lady saying she's not coming back because she likes her bread and potatoes too much. So it's not for everybody. Um, and recently we've got the Verta study published, it's not a randomised controlled trial, but massive, uh, really, really good improvements, a reduction in H1C of 14 at one year. And these individuals were advised to have less than 30 grams of carbohydrate and they just tested, self-tested their blood ketone levels. 83% were still following the diet at one year, so I think that's a really important fact. And more recently, the cardiovascular disease um, impact of this diet have been published. And you can see there that 60 to 80% of individuals had desired outcomes for reducing cardiovascular disease risk. So the last section here, and I couldn't do a presentation without talking about saturated fat, could I? So here we are, to finish off, saturated fat. They recommend that saturated fat should be replaced with unsaturated fat. And what do they do? They reference previous recommendations. But they also refer to the Cochrane Systematic Review, the Lee Hooper one that was uh, published in 2015.
Now, when you look at the 15 clinical trials included in this review, only a handful of them actually documented that they reduced saturated fat and they tested for cardiovascular disease events. And when there was, these results were reanalyzed, then there was no statistically significant effect. So that 17% relative risk reduction dropped to 9% and it was no longer statistically significant. So now I think that gives us the hardest data to say reducing saturated fat in the diet does not reduce cardiovascular disease, mortality or events. And what about, oh, not all saturated fats are equal, and so Nitti Ferrari actually stood up at the Diabetes UK presentation and reminded the panel about this. They acknowledged it and actually said that they hoped that these recommendations would be, uh, become electronic so they could update it. So that's really, really good if we recognise that there's 36 different types of saturated fat and we can't just kind of blanket them all under one recommendation. Replacing saturated fat for polyunsaturated fat, then believe it or not, there was only three studies that actually achieved this. And it was only in 5% of the 59,000 participants in this study. So how can you say in a recommendation that replacing polyunsaturated fat for saturated fat is effective? Moving on, the SAC uh, committee have just launched their update or their recommendation for saturated fat and health. And if you're looking at the cardiovascular disease guidance there, then they have identified 17 meta-analyses or 17 systematic reviews, 11 of which have got meta-analyses. No RCT evidence with positive effect at all and only three cohort studies with a very, very weak effect, very near to the one line. So it doesn't really provide us with any confidence at all of reducing saturated fat in the diet. So to finish off, last couple of slides, then there's some good stuff. It's a step in the right direction for Diabetes UK. They're trying to use food-based recommendations rather than macronutrient-based. They're supporting an individualised approach. They're offering flexibility and they're encouraging you know, natural fats in foods such as cheese and yoghurt. But it's not rocket science, isn't it? I would have done the recommendations, eat good quality carbohydrates to tolerance. Yeah? Moderate amount of good quality protein. Natural fats to fullness. They haven't mentioned anywhere about the frequency of eating. So diabetes and PAC, there's evidence in there that people who eat on more than three occasions a day are more likely to have food addiction cut the snack in there's no no mention of that in the recommendations and also as I've already alluded to we need to look at where people are losing the fat from not just base it on a percentage weight loss goal and there's movement there's movement and resistance exercise stress busters good sleep and alcohol in moderation <laughs> so back to my Yorkshire roots E by gum, it's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> Thank you.